Kia ora, na mihi nui, ke koutou katoa. Welcome to this special interview brought to you by Shearsies. My name is Alice, I work at Shearsies, and we are joined today by Shane Elliott, who is the CEO of ANZ Group. ANZ Group is the Australasian provider of financial services and is currently around the seventh largest company by market cap on the Australian Securities Exchange. Two weeks ago, ANZ announced an agreement to acquire Suncorp Bank for 4.9 billion Australian dollars, and that's the largest banking deal in Australia in over a decade. Right now, to help fund the acquisition, ANZ is undertaking a capital raise. So we are chatting to Shane today to get a better understanding about the Suncorp deal, as well as, as, well as ANZ more generally. Now, many of the questions that I'm asking Shane are from you, our listeners, who submitted these questions in advance, and you can see them in the question box below. We'll also be making this webinar available as a podcast, and a, re and a replay will be uploaded to YouTube. But before I get any further, I do have a legal disclaimer. Investing involves risk. You aren't guaranteed to make money and you might lose the money you started with. Any information we provide is general only and current at the time. If you're looking for help with your investment choices, we recommend talking to a licensed financial advice provider. We won't be providing any personalized advice as part of this webinar. And finally, Sharesies may be paid a fee for distributing the offer to Sharesies investors. Also, just a quick reminder today that we won't be taking any questions from the audience during the session, and we won't be asking any specific questions about the capital raise itself, as ANZ are unable to respond to questions of that nature. And now, with all of that housekeeping out of the way, welcome Shane. Uh, kia ora, thanks for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to start things off, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, tell us a bit about ANZ Group and your role there. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Well, um, thanks for the introduction. It's a great opportunity to speak to um, our New Zealand uh, shareholders. I don't think I have to introduce ANZ. I think it's pretty well known um, across uh, across the country. Um, we actually were the very first bank in New Zealand from 1840. And even today, you know, in many measures, we're the largest company in New Zealand, the largest taxpayer. And actually, we deal with, we have a relationship with literally half of all uh, New Zealanders in some way, shape or form. So it's great, um, a great business for us. It's about, New Zealand represents about a quarter um, of the group and we run four major divisions across the group. New Zealand, our institutional bank, which operates around the world, intermediating trade and capital flow. And that's something that ANZ is particularly strong at uh, on a global basis. And then we have a retail business here in Australia, much like the business we have in New Zealand and what we call our commercial bank, which are services, um, small and medium sized businesses here. So um, just before I start, just to acknowledge Sharesies. Sharesies is not only the uh, customer of ANZ, uh, we share a board member. The chair of Sharesies is actually on the New Zealand board and uh, Alison Geary. So I've got to, had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with Alison. Hey, um, only a couple of weeks ago, we made three pretty important announcements. We gave our third quarter trading update. So uh, up to June 30th, which was really important, really strong quarter for us. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we announced uh, the acquisition of Suncorp Bank. I'll talk a little bit about that. Probably known to many shareholders. Probably doesn't have a presence in New Zealand, but um, it's a pretty well-known name because of their insurance operations, uh, Trans Tasman, and the associated capital raising. You know, uh, the three and a half billion dollars that we're raising to fund that uh, acquisition, including the retail component, which opened uh, 26th of July and closes at 5 p.m. on August 15th. Now, the we opted for in terms of that capital raise for a renounceable rights issue. And the reason we did that is we think that's the fairest possible structure for all of our shareholders, uh, particularly retail, uh, shareholders wherever they may be located. Um, ANZ has about 550,000 uh, shareholders and 40% of those are held by retail holders, mostly here in Australia and uh, New Zealand. Now, um, there's a longer timetable than people might be used to, but that's because we wanted to be able to give retail shareholders sufficient time to digest the news and, and understand you know the purpose of why we're raising the capital i'd also like to note that as part of that our board did advise it is their intention uh to pay a full 72 cents australian uh cents a uh, cents per share dividend for the final dividend later this year and that we're maintaining our dividend payout ratios that's a question many people ask given the amount you know significant amount of capital that we're raising hey so before we talk about the uh, trend just quickly about third quarter as I said, really strong uh, quarter actually, strong volume growth across all our businesses, strong margin momentum across all our businesses, particularly in New Zealand, because New Zealand, as you know, is further ahead in terms of the rate rising cycle. So rate rises have become faster and bigger in New Zealand than they certainly have here in Australia. 
And that is also true in our businesses, which are exposed to US dollars. So particularly our institutional bank, we have a very, very significant large um, deposit base in US dollars, unlike some of our local peer banks. And they've also benefited from the sort of aggressive rate rises that we're seeing in the United States. So Australia, uh, so Australia further behind in the third quarter, we didn't really see too much of a margin impact in the third quarter, but clearly um, Australia is catching up fast. And so we would expect that to be a little bit of a tailwind in terms of margins. Just for those um, that may not uh, cover the banks quite so intensely, why is that a positive? Because essentially we are able to, we pass on the interest rate rises to the people who borrow money and we do pass it on to many of our deposits but in terms of the, the relative balance, it is far more um, beneficial to us on a net basis because many of our deposits, not all, but many of them don't bear interest. They're the transactional accounts that people have. So there's a net benefit when rates rise. There's a general observation um, for banks, and that's what we're seeing. So group revenue in the third quarter was up 5% versus the average of the first two quarters. But it was actually up 6% if you exclude the move, the noise that comes about because of foreign currency translation. Yeah. Home loans in Australia and New Zealand, which is the single largest amount on our balance sheet, remained really um, robust. Um, and we've seen a bit of a slowdown in New Zealand with house prices, and we're starting to see that here. But nonetheless, the business volumes there look uh, pretty decent. As I mentioned, margins improved across the board in all of our businesses. At a headline number, there was three basis points for the group. But actually, on an underlying basis, we take out the noise in our treasury management and things. So actually, the customer rate of you well, was actually up six basis points in the quarter so pretty strong number to 164 basis points in total that's the revenue side on the cost side ANZ I think has built a really strong reputation for managing costs we've kept our costs pretty flat for running the bank so we separate run the bank day-to-day -day branches people service centers all that sort of stuff now run the bank costs which are about 80 percent of our total cost base are, are continue to be flat so we're absorbing inflation offsetting that with productivity that's getting harder as we start to deal into more and more uh, wage inflation and other vendor inflation. But we've signaled that we expect for the second half, so the full second half, we expect to, those run the bank to be broadly flat um, on the first half, right? Um, collective provision balance, so our, our credit risk, the, the money we set aside for a rainy day, uh, 3.8 billion Australian dollars. That's 400 million, or about 10% higher than it was before we went into COVID, before we'd even heard of COVID. It was a, a little high, so we've kept that pretty high uh, number because you know there, there's still a level of uncertainty about how the economy is going to fare on both sides of the Tasman in particular you know there's some positive stories unemployment retains extraordinarily low um if we look at the credit performance in our books still really really good so people are still uh, people are, are, are getting through despite the fact that interest rates are rising but nonetheless we've kept a prudent amount on our balance sheet just in case and that 3.8 billion that includes a, almost 800 million dollars not quite what we call overlays. So those are just management where we're taking some discretion and said, look, the models say X, but we've added a little bit more for that uncertainty um, around the future. And then finally, our capital levels remain really strong at 11.1%. Now, that's a little bit lower than normal because in the third quarter, well, that's when we pay our dividend and that reduces it by about 0.4%. Yeah. In terms of the transaction, we're really excited about this uh, acquisition. Suncorp, in our view, is the last high quality banking franchise available um, in, in the market really good bank, uh, purely domestic here in Australia. Uh, mostly about half of the business is in Queensland, which is the youngest, fastest growing state in the country. So lots to like about it from a demographic point of view and probably the hardest one to break into <laughs> organically. Um, so difficult uh, state. So we're getting, we're getting a million uh, retail customers as part of this uh, acquisition, 700,000 of whom live in Queensland. About 400,000 of them are what we call main bank main financial institution customers. So those are people, if you ask them, who's your bank, they'll say Suncorp. So these are people who are really, really loyal uh, there. So that's great. They're the people who will st uh, stick around. And we get another 170,000 small business customers as well, which increases our reach in small business by almost a third. So really a, a big step forward for us in terms of our customer reach. In terms of the price we're paying, $4.9 billion. Um, if we do nothing and just run the bank as it is today, uh, it's earnings per share neutral and also uh, return on equity neutral. So that means that doesn't include any synergies, just add the two banks together and you get a pretty good, decent outcome. But obviously we are gonna get synergies, both revenue and expense synergies. Um, we're gonna be cautious about that. And for those in New Zealand who know extremely well, we're gonna take the similar approach we took when ANZ acquired the National Bank, uh, which we'll, we'll take it 
cautiously. We want to retain those customers. That's what we bought. And so we're going to be thoughtful about the way we integrate over a period of time. But we're highly confident we get to drive significant synergy. So what do we get? Our mortgage book here in Australia increases by 17%. Our business lending increases by 20%. And our retail deposit book, which is really valuable, increases by 22%. So a pretty strong step up um, for us. And as I said, um, we're confident in our ability to integrate it. We've um, negotiated like we did in New Zealand to keep in New Zealand, we kept the National Bank brand for a long period of time. Here, we're able to keep the Suncorp brand for up to seven years. So that gives us time to work through integration and looking after those customers. So I'll leave it at that and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, great. And uh, that's a great place to, to finish up there because we have had a bunch of questions from our listeners around the acquisition. Uh, and you just mentioned then around integration. Uh, I, I have a question from Barbara who says, uh, if Past examples are anything to go by. Integrations can be long, expensive, and underestimated. Uh, how is ANZ mitigating these risks? Yeah, that's a really great question. So we asked ourselves the same questions when we put the deal together. So we're very cautious when we so when we when we did our modeling, Barbara and others, we we sort of were very, very cautious. So we've assumed not kind of the worst case, but we've assumed things are going to be slow, expensive, that customers are going to leave, all of that stuff. And it still makes sense. Now, what we've done to mix so it in our financial modeling, we've taken a very, very conservative case. But actually, what we've done is we've lent a lot on the experience we had in New Zealand with the National Bank. Now, in the, we bought the National Bank in New Zealand in 2003. We didn't integrate it until 2014. So that was too long. I agree with that. And I've been on the board in New Zealand since 2009. That wasn't because we couldn't. It was because we did it around trying to figure out whether one brand or two brand was the right strategy, right? But once we made that decision, actually getting on with it only took us a couple of years. And we were able to migrate all of those National Bank customers onto ANZ. And the reality is, but we didn't lose any. We literally lost no customers. I'm sure there was a few at the edges. So we were able to maintain that, quality, that franchise. And that's the approach we'll take here. So we've learned a lot. A lot of the people who did that work are still in the New Zealand Bank. Some of them are actually here in, in Australia. I was around on the board at the time. So we've learned a lot. And we're digging deep to use that experience as a bit of a model. So these things are complex. But the other reason, the other mitigant here is this is a simple bank. It's not a distressed bank. It's not a broken bank. It's a good bank. And if you look at what they do, it's very simple. They take deposits. They do home loans. They've got a very small credit card business, and they've got some small business accounts. It, it, it is So the integration, the differences between A and Z and Suncorp are very slight. So moving two businesses together that look and feel very similar is much easier um, than, 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 you know, taking two banks that are in complete, you know, taking an investment bank and a commercial bank, for example, and they're really, you know, kind of different. The other thing I think that gives us a lot of comfort, Barbara, is the culture. You know, that's not to be um, underestimated. Cultural fit, and I've been through a number of mergers and uh, things in my career. Those are the things that really define success. And the culture at Suncor was very similar to the one here, very values driven, very customer oriented. It's a good place with good people. And so, you know, there's risk. But we've got a good team. We've got some great experience to draw on. And as I say, in terms of our modelling, we really make sure we took a conservative approach. Great. Thanks, Shane. Another question here. Uh, what makes you confident such an acquisition will be approved by regulators? And how long might this process take? Great question. So there are three stages to go through. There's the ACCC, which is our you know, the competition regulator here. We need, it's a long story, but there's a special act of parliament in the state of Queensland, the Suncorp Metway Act, which has certain requirements around it. So we need to get the state treasurer approval, and then we need the federal treasurer approval. So in Australia, much like in New Zealand, the, the, the government has to approve any change of ownership of more than 15% in a financial institution, right? So we have to go through those three. All of those three are really going to take a competition view of the world. Our argument is, is relatively simple, and we're highly confident we get this through. And so the argument, and I won't go through all of it, we don't have time, but the simple answer is, hey, Sun, we didn't go, Suncorp Bank came to us. So they approached us because Suncorp Group don't want to own this bank anymore. So they don't want it, right? It's an orphan. And so they want to find a good parent for it. They chose us, yeah? So I think they, they Suncorp, have a very good reason and rationale why this is in the interest of their customers because they don't feel that their inability to invest sufficiently to give it sufficient capital and capability to drive good customer outcomes. So they want somebody who's going to be a good custodian and invest upon their business. So that's argument one. Argument two, uh, with this acquisition, ANZ across the nation will go from 13% share in retail banking to 15 The idea that there's some pricing power or something that we get at 15% doesn't hold water. Uh, CBA is 26%. Yeah, uh, Westpac's 23 
our argument is that actually having slightly more scale will make us a better competitor. Um, and so, look, I think there's some really, and there are, for those interested, there, there is a legal um, sort of process within the ACCC. There's a definition of competition and reduction of competition. Certainly when you just run through the technical application of that, we will get uh, that through. But we're very mindful. It's up to us to prove, in particular to the people of Queensland, but not only, but in particular, that this is a good outcome for customers. We believe it is. And we've made commitments around how we will invest behind this acquisition to use it as a platform for growth. So this isn't a, you know, ripping cost out kind of acquisition. We see it as an, we're requiring 1.2 million customers and we want to invest in that to get even more. So I think we can make a good argument on that one. And we know we'll get a fair hearing. On that uh, note around market share, uh, there's a question from Ken who says that over the past four years, ANZ's market share for home loans has dropped. Apart from this acquisition, what are the plans to further increase this and catch up to the other major banks? Yeah, so it's a great question, Ken. Um, it's true. Actually, it depends on your time frame, though. So if you look over 20 years, um, actually, all of the banks essentially have gone nowhere in market share except for the benefit of acquisitions. So when Westpac bought St. George or CBA bought Bank West, the rest is largely noise. It kind of goes up and down. The problem is that people tend to look in the short term and say, hey, over the last year, so-and-so went up and so-and-so went down. That's true. Um, but over the longer term, what it shows is in a, in a market like ours, and this is true in New Zealand as well, it's really, really hard organically to grow market share. Yeah, um, custom for all sorts of reasons. So that's true. And we sort of fessed up. We had some issues in our processing capacity. So we're building an entirely new bank uh, called ANZ Plus, which is a whole sort of a new digital backbone and a whole new processing capacity, which we're really excited about. It's in market at the moment, not doing home loans, but everything else will get there soon on home loans. And in the meantime, you know, we underinvested in our traditional processing capacity, which is largely manual, like all the banks. And so when we got a housing boom last year, and nobody saw that coming in terms of the COVID reaction to housing, and the same in New Zealand, we just struggled to, to process the volume. So it's not that people don't want to choose ANZ, not at all. In fact, the problem is we've got too many people who want to choose ANZ, and we weren't ready to process volume. In that situation, what happens is if your turnaround times are too slow, people go somewhere else. So we fixed that. That is no longer an issue. The latest APRA data was out last Friday. We're back in the game. We're back growing. We're back broadly in line with our major bank peers. We've got more to do, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're back in that and really excited about launching our new digital home loan, which will go into testing later this year with a rollout uh, next year, which really, and what, why is that important? Basically, it will mean, you know, for those who have all the right documents and approvals, almost real-time approval, and not everybody wants that, or I get understand that, but we can if we want, and it'll be 100% um, digital for those who want it. And so that's a really exciting. So that basically means those turnaround times come down to essentially zero for those that have all the right information. Um, and it's largely, it, you know, there's no real scale challenges and something like that. You know, we don't have to hire more people if we if we end up in a, in a boom period. Really interesting hearing about your progress in the digital space. Uh, this almost um, might have covered this um, question, which was also from Ken. Uh, but it was related to Westpac's recent announcement that um, they're launching a mortgage that could be approved in about 10 minutes and how ANZ is planning to compete with that. Yeah, well, um, I don't mean to be dismissive, Ken, but anybody can approve a home. I can approve one in five seconds. It's easy to just say yes, mm -hmm. right? The problem is, can you do it well? And let's not forget risk. Like our business is, we're not selling toothpaste here, right? Uh, and so we need to make sure that we are actually booking the right loans on the right risk profile with people who can afford it and are going to be around, you know, with jobs and the ability to repay responsibly over time. And so we need to be able to assess that. We've already got a 10-minute home loan, digital home loan, so we've got one of those. Uh, uh, we, have it, we have a company called One Two Finance, which is a JV with Lendy, which is the largest uh, broker here in Australia. That business there, if, again, you can go online and you can talk to somebody on a video chat. And if you submit all your documents, um, if you just submit all your documents online, you can get an approval. The reality is that most people don't have all their documents online and, and don't want that sort of service. So I'm not dismissing it. I think having a digital real-time approval is going to be table stakes. Every bank will have one. I agree. That is not going to be sufficient to really make a difference. Um, and so, you know, remember most people, the reason that home loans take time, by the way, is not generally it's not the bank. As the customers turn up and they don't have all their pay slips and they've forgot their bank statements, they can't tell you 
what their, their what their expenses are. And so we have to spend time uh, doing the right thing, both in New Zealand and Australia, by the way, to check and verify. And that takes a little bit of time. The other thing, and there's a slight difference in ANZ specialty in Australia, not so much in New Zealand, is what we call complex home loans. So most, you know, 80% of home loans are um, for us are owner occupiers, and they're people with it, for, a lot of them have uh, people with a job, and they have a pay slope. But actually, something that ANZ specialises in is people who are self-employed. Yeah, so that can be almost 35, 40 percent of our flow that people are self-employed. Well, as you can imagine, verifying a self, you know, the plumber's income is a lot harder. It takes a bit more time than somebody who's got a pay slip from, you know, from Spark. Um, so that that just takes a little bit more time. So like for like isn't always the right. But anyway, your point. Yes, we've we've already got one of them, and we're building another one, a better one. Um, so I think everybody will have the sort of digital home loan thing over the next sort of 12 months. And I, but I don't think that's going to be sufficient to win in the long term. Great. Thank you. Uh, going back to the Suncorp deal, um, question from Sean asking around uh, the funding of it. Uh, he points out that in 2021, ANZ unveiled a $1.5 billion share buyback program. And he'd like to know why is ANZ buying back shares on the market when it could have used this money to help fund the purchase of Suncorp? Because we didn't know we were going to buy Suncorp then. You know, the reality is, you know, you deal with the reality of the time. And at that time, we had excess capital. And if I, if we hadn't returned it, we'd have sat on something like this. And shareholders quite rightly would have said, why are you keeping all that uh, capital? Why don't you give it back to shareholders? So, you know, we've got to manage that in real time. So at the time, we had too much capital. We didn't have a use for it. We only got approached by Suncorp Group in April, about then, March, April. So there it wasn't even an inkling that that was going to happen. And again, let's uh, just you know, for the record, we didn't we didn't go to them. They came to us, and they came to us. You know, I, I think it was sort of March, April to start those conversations. So we didn't we didn't know. So I think you know that's the reality of capital management. You have to manage it in the real time. You can't just sit on billions and billions of dollars for you know maybe one day there'll be an acquisition opportunity because that that money burns a hole in your pocket because you know you're not generating return. And by the way, it's your money. And I, I don't think it'd be responsible for us to say, oh, we're going to keep it just in case. So we try to keep a dynamic thing on that. I think ANZ actually, well, I don't think, or no, ANZ's been the most prudent in terms of managing sh uh, shareholders' funds over the last six or seven years. You know, until recently, we were the only bank to reduce our share count. You know, we literally, you know, we were very conscious and very prudent. We didn't raise, we didn't panic in, in COVID and raise capital just in case. And we've returned it when um, we, we have no need for it. But today, I think, again, I'm, you know, Today, we've, we announced, well, not today, but the other day, we, we announced a transaction and we come to our shareholders and say, hey, this is our transaction. We think it's great and we'd like your support. And you can subscribe uh, to shares um, in the group uh, to support that transaction. And we think, that's the, we think that's the sort of right way to go about these things. Great. Uh, last couple of questions before we yeah. will need to wrap up. Um, this one's around corporate governance. And uh, Shane, you mentioned right at the very start about uh, there's the ANZ Group Board and then also the ANZ New Zealand Board. Uh, now, you may remember that New Zealand's Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr raised some concerns around the conflict of interest. Uh, I think this was more generally for Australian banks, um, but around, say, Sir John Key being on both the ANZ Parent Board and the local ANZ yeah. New Zealand board. Uh, the main concern was as follows, if an Australian parent company got into trouble and a director sat on the Australian and New Zealand boards and the Australian board wanted to bring back bring money back from New Zealand, it would be difficult for a director to act in the best interests of both boards at the same time. Uh, Sean would like to know how you are addressing this. Well, so first of all, I don't agree with that um, assertion. And I think board directors very much are aware of their responsibilities and they, you know, board, board members are on multiple boards and they understand that. And if there was a conflict, and there has been over the years, those directors excuse themselves from decision making. I would point out to Sean that actually it's the reverse that has happened over time, that in the GFC, it precisely the reverse happened. It was the New Zealand banks who got into trouble and it was the Australian parents who bailed them out and put in capital to support the banks during that period. So I think, you know, the reality has been that the Australian bank parents, uh, ANZ in particular, have been very thoughtful and protective of our investments in our franchise in the country. And I think it has worked uh, to the benefit of both sides of the Tasman, both shareholders, customers, and the community overall. But I, you know, I think the bank does a really, as you can imagine, you spend a lot of time thinking about those issues and conflicts. I think the reverse is also true, right? Are we really saying in a group like ANZ where ANZ New Zealand is such an important part 
of the group, it shouldn't be represented at the board. We should have nobody on the board who has any particular insight into New Zealand or what's happening. That would also seem rather odd, um, I think. Um, now, look, I'm on the board in New Zealand as well, and I'm a New Zealander, and, you know, it's not my home. But I think having those cross-board memberships has real value, and we're really mindful of the conflicts and the potential, and we, we run that really diligently, as do the other banks, by the way. We're not alone in that. Great. Thanks, Shane. A uh, question from myself, actually, um, and might wrap up after that. Um, you mentioned before that Queensland is a tough market to uh, tap into. Why is that the case? Oh, well, you, you spend more time in Queensland. Um, there's, look, it's a, bit, it's a bit overstated. It's this idea of this sort of parochial Queenslander, right? Um, and the reason I said, so part of it's true, you know, in Australia, people, you know, states are, you know, we have the state structure and that people very identify with their state, you know, not just for sports, but just in general. By the way, it's not a lot different um, for those, you're probably too young to remember, but uh, when ANZ bought the National Bank, we had the same argument. Oh, you know, the National Bank people are very parochial because they're all rural and they're in the regions and they'll never bank blue. They'll never move to ANZ. Well, that was all ended up being rubbish. I mean, people are very practical and pragmatic and, and they go where they see value and they want to be looked after and respected and treated well, no doubt. And so our job is to really talk to the customers and all the future potential customers across the country and explain why ANZ can deliver value for them. But that's basically what it is. And historically, for banks just to kind of turn up and open branches and, and expect customers, that has been hard. Um, and I, it's not unique to Queensland. Queensland is probably an extreme. Western Australia has also been difficult, you know, um, in that regard. So, but look, hey, I think it's largely overstated. And part of the reason it's overstated is Queensland is the fastest growing state in the country from a demographic point of view. And get, so guess what? A lot of people don't cross the border into Queensland and suddenly become parochial. Um, many of the people who live there today didn't grow up there. They came from, in particular, New South Wales. But even over the last two years, one of the biggest migrations in Queensland has come from Victoria. So there's just a gen so it's not quite the issue, but his history would say you have to be really thoughtful. And I think it's just a question of being respectful of your customer base, irrespective of where they're from, whether they're from, you know, Timaru or whether they're from Rockhampton. Uh, it's about being respectful and understanding what those customers want and expect in terms of service and brands, and that, you know, we shouldn't sit here in Melbourne and assume we know best, or that, you know, what works in Melbourne works in Cairns, because that isn't true, no different than what works in Auckland works in Invercargill. So I think, you know, it's just about having some respect um, for that, but also accepting that we've got a lot of work to do to convince people that ANZ is a, um, you know, is the right place for them and that we'll be a good custodian of their, their financial well-being over, over the long term. Great. Thank you, Shane. Uh, and that does take us to 12.30. Uh, so we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we do really appreciate your time to talk uh, with us and chat about ANZ. Great. Thank you very much. And um, thanks. for It's great to see so many people um, interested. Um, just so that you know, we've got our New Zealand is an important part of ANZ. It is a quarter of our bank. We it, it's an incredible part of our history. Um, we our group board is actually coming to New Zealand in three or four weeks. So early September, um, we come over. We try to come every year, but obviously that's been we've been unable to for COVID. So the entire board's coming group board will be coming over, spending time a week there with regulators, customers, our people, of course. Um, getting out and about and you know to get a better understanding of the state of the economy um, how the bank's going where we can grow what we can do more of um, and so that'll be a really important uh, period of time i'm actually coming to wellington in two weeks time because we have the new zealand board of which i'm on is actually meeting down in wellington for a few days in a few weeks as well so i just want to assure people it's an important part of the group and we treat it with the required respect and make sure that we spend time on the ground um, understanding our customers as well as we can so thanks very much for your time no, thank you.